ability to produce a miracle testifies to the validity of no particular faith. Um, they could, their, their conjury could produce great wonders also. So what we appear to be looking at is an angry competition for monopoly affection among an oligopoly of potential deities, somewhat more like the cruelty and caprice of Olympus. And the story is told by the already terrified fans of the apparent winner. So you, if you like, you can call of all of that one commandment, but it seems to me to be multiple ones and multiple injunctions. You are still, with the, with the jealousy and with the vanity and the caprice, you still have a separate commandment on not taking the Lord's name in vain. And once again, it's all backed up with the specific threat that offenses will not be soon forgiven. In fact, let me quickly, if I can find it quickly, not waste the time of that very nice Xerox operator, actually read it to you as it occurs in the King James Version. Both of these multiple commandments. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So you might think that someone who keeps the commandments won't have their children persecuted um, unto the next generation, so that if, if the next generation of children didn't keep the commandments, they'd still be protected by the fact that their parents had kept the commandments. But no, no. <laughs> Um, thou shalt not take the name of thy Lord in, uh, the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Right. See where I'm going with that. Um, all of this suggesting a great insecurity and unease. Then comes the requirement, again tediously repeated, for the observance of the Sabbath day. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, I may as well finish this, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Um, uncontroversial in itself, a day off, but again, having nothing to do in this case with ethics or morality, but only with the fear of the Lord. It is only obedience to that fear that is moral. And it's interesting as marking, not for the first time uh, or the last, those to whom it applies. Male bosses and employers are the ones addressed. And their manservants and maidservants, nor their cattle, are permitted to work on Sunday or the Shabbat. A confusion between people and chattel that is going to recur again very soon. Indeed, if anything, can show you that there's a, a good argument that the commandments are man-made and not God-ordained, it would be the general exodus emphasis on agriculture and sheep and lamb and goat products in general. I had a debate on the BBC recently with um, uh, Canon Slee, uh, one of the deputies of the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, in which I said that one of the things I, I disliked about Christianity when I was quite small was having to think of myself as a member of a flock in other words, as a sheep or lamb. Um, and also to having to reflect that shepherds don't look after sheep just because they like them, though some shepherds like them much too much. <laughs> but in order that they can first fleece them and then kill them. Um, and Slee, to his credit, he took me up on it rather decently. He said, you know, it was a problem for us with, with the church in New Guinea where I served for a considerable time because, as with a huge number of areas of the world, there are no sheep in New Guinea. Exodus is limited in that way too. Even the animals it describes aren't available everywhere. So he said, we had to work out what the locals in New Guinea valued as the Israelites would have valued sheep. He said, it got to the point where one Easter, I saw my bishop get up into the pulpit and address his congregation and say in English to them, O oh Lord, behold, these your swine. <laughs> so you see where how off the track you can get, off the beaten track you get with agricultural uh, metaphors and how confining... They can be, and of course it would have to be a pig, the very one that Yahweh most eloquently condemns elsewhere. As I say, if this is God-made, it looks somewhat man-made all the same. Now, furthermore, if one day and only one day is holy, it can suggest that others are profane. And that's led to a good deal of fetishism of the, of the Sabbath and of Shabbat. I remember when I used to work in Northern Ireland, 
trying to point out to the Reverend Ian Paisley, I worked for a Sunday show at the time. He wouldn't be interviewed by anyone whose show or newspaper came out on Sunday. So I tried to point out to him, Reverend, the, it's the Monday papers that are printed on the Sunday. And I could see his piggy eyes sort of narrowing as he took this in. Um, it took him a long, long time before he'd given an interview to the Observer. Um, but if, in the end, um, reason prevailed. So why not just say that the worker deserves one day off in seven? Why say that it's necessary only because the Lord, who effortlessly made heaven and earth in six days, doing what came naturally, rested on the seventh? Anyway, make a note of this stipulation, small though it may seem, because it's coming back. It's crucially varied in the Deuteronomy version. All right, moving right along. The next five commandments are famously brisk and terse, with the slight exception of the order to honor one's parents, because that comes not with the threat of punishment, but with an inducement this time. Obey it, and thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So once again, one's forced to notice these rules are not being urged for their own sake, or because they are innately and self-evidently moral. They're being urged either to avoid the punishment of four, generation of one, four generations of one's children or in order to be given land that until now had belonged to Canaanites and other lesser breeds. They come to us, in other words, not as precepts of morality, but, that, but as accompanied and bodyguarded by a mixture of threats and promises. And it's interesting to notice that parents are nowhere told that they must be good to their children. But there may be a good reason for that too, and I'm coming back to that also. You'll forgive this fan dance of mine, promising you things down the road, <laughs> if you don't shuffle too much. Okay, then the celebrated commandments against murder, adultery, theft, and perjury follow without any adornment, um, or with any bribe or threat. The King James Version famously says, thou shalt not kill, though the original Hebrew makes it very obvious that the meaning is, thou shalt do no murder. These transliterations, by the way, can be very hazardous and very useful. The Hebrew word Alma, for example, uh, means young woman. That's all it means. When mistranslated by King James's committee as virgin, it very much alters the idea that a young woman will one day conceive and bring forth a son. And a great deal of misunderstanding has resulted from that error in translation. I'm, re I'm reminded of the lady governor of Texas, who during a controversy about bilingualism in the state house, in Austin said, if English was good enough for Jesus Christ, it was plenty good enough for her. <laughs> uh, we so far haven't found any, any society in which the penal code, we've looked, anthropologists have searched, we've found no society in which the penal code approves of or is neutral about murder <coughs> or theft or perjury. Adultery is, is treated differently in different cultures, but the murder, theft, and perjury are not. Um, one might argue that the Jewish people wouldn't have made it as far as they did to Mount Sinai, assuming always that they did make the trip, if they had been under the impression that murder, theft, perjury, and adultery were okay until they uh, got there. The Analects of Confucius mention the golden rule, or they have a version of it. They say, don't do to another person what would be repulsive to you if done to yourself. Um, the Babylonian rabbi Hillel more or less states the same thing when asked if you can summarize the whole of the Torah while standing on one foot. He says, yes, I can. Don't do to another what would be repellent if done to you. All else, there is the, the law, all else is commentary. Um, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which was already mentioned, which you can go see. Um, Moses, I might just add to the excellent gloss that William put on it. Um, Moses was supposed to have been, according to the story, a prince in Egypt. He would have had to know Egyptian law if he was a real person and if the story has any factual base. He would have had to know what someone would have had to testify in the Book of the Dead that they had not done, or indeed had done. He would have had to know the quite sophisticated Egyptian court system, of which we have reasonably good records. Um, at least a thousand years before Exodus was written down, that's to say at least a thousand years before 1400 BC, Hammurabi promulgates a code of law in Babylon not far away that becomes pretty celebrated, particularly for its emphasis on the lex talionis, so-called. In other words, the concept of direct symbolic retribution, eye for an eye, uh, tooth for a tooth. So even if we had any reason to believe that the story of the enslavement in Egypt was true, or the wandering in the desert was true, or the conquest of the promised 